the Ministry of Timelines bears no official responsibility for the content of this research. A temporal incursion is in progress. Following Ministry protocols, this timeline will be quarantined until further notice. Evacuated agents are being treated for cascade sickness. The committee has approved. A coronal suture will be performed to prevent this incursion spreading. Intervention assets are now on standby. Recommend extraction and debrief of ersatz intelligences claiming to have knowledge on temporal incursions prior to suture. Venus exploded. The warning about Morningstar being released from his cage was finally realized. An entity was discovered leaving the exploding planet. Having pretended to be Satan, he used the belief in the fallen angel to free him from his imprisonment, blaming a hidden group called the Seraph, who he claimed had been controlling the Commonwealth for eons. Despite the almost earth-shattering revelation, 2320 brought peace in our time. The Great Galactic War ended in victory for the Council of Four. Many hostile nations were brought under the autocratic rule of the Order of the Drake. August 2320 also saw a shift in rule, as the disgraced radical cultist Tinker Bell was ousted as PM and replaced by Bell Tinker, whose mullet and lack of mustache set them distinctly apart as different entities. The leader of the opposition said, Come on mate, we're all pretending not to know it's you. The fake mustache was fine, but there's no need to suffer the indignity of a mullet. The task managers and Commonwealth colluded to split galactic power between themselves in early 2322 with the task managers making themselves custodian and the Commonwealth becoming president of the Council of Four for an indefinite period. The other partners in the Federation only wished they thought of it first. An audio transcript was leaked in which the king of the task managers referred unkindly to the Order of the Drake. He was heard saying, give them a cat toy and they'll just start chasing it, hoping to vassalize it. Representatives from the Order of the Drake seemed to miss the insult when the audio file eventually reached them, merely asking where the Cat Toy Empire was and if they could declare a war of vassalization upon it. Jump drives were fitted to the Commonwealth fleets in 2322, allowing previously unparalleled and instantaneous travel across the galaxy by just ripping through space, time and other dimensions. Parliament, who approved the use of jump drives, ignored their engineers' advice against such technology, apparently not realizing the engineers were using the term ripping quite literally. Intelligence services reported the fleet of the Death Lords military had become overwhelmingly strong. The king dismissed this claim as impossible and a power grab he refused to believe they could have mustered such a fleet in so short a time. Everyone knew, after all, that cloaking technology didn't exist. The king went on to lecture the public on the use of the derogatory term Death Lords, calling it a clearly classist title which should not be used by uneducated proles and riffraff. The king blamed the colloquial name on translation issues, refusing to believe anyone would choose to call themselves Death Lords, much to the bemusement of teenagers everywhere. In 2323, after great political maneuvering across the galaxy, the task managers finally cemented their position and forced the galactic community to vote them in as custodians. The King of the Commonwealth was very pleased with this news as their plan was falling into place. A procedural crisis then unfolded in Parliament as the Council of Four naval vessels formed in the Zell Madak system, preparing to attack the entity codenamed Toxic God in the Arcturus system. 
representatives argued that the Toxic God was a protected entity under the new Spaceborn Fauna Protection Act, whilst others argued that its obvious threat to humanity and other life effectively removed any legal protections. Fingers were pointed at those trying to argue for the Toxic God's preservation. Accusations hurled that they must be part of the dark cult spreading through the government of the Greater British Commonwealth. Codronite representative Simus delved deep into their tea-related puns during a Council of Four meeting. Finally, getting on the nerves of King Montgomery to the extent that the King banned the use of sovereign tea as a word in his great nation. The legality of the ban was carefully scrutinised by AWE legal experts, not wanting to undermine the monarch's sovereignty. Wait, sovereign tea? I just got it! A bundle of new JeffPad 666s was sent to the Order of the Drake in 2324 to congratulate them on completing a long quest to find their toxic god. Planned obsolescence meant they were already out of date by the time the king arrived to congratulate them in person, delivering his speech rather undiplomatically from a JeffPad 701. The drums of war were heard across the galaxy as the Great Khan, on every channel and every frequency, announced their emergence as the greatest threat in existence. The task managers saw their awakening within the Yaxka Horde as a grave threat to the Council of Four, and called a meeting for all members. The humans, however, considered it an overblown issue, disputing the need for even having a meeting, seeing it as a mere border dispute for the Yaxka to deal with. When asked why the Prime Minister ordered a new fleet of battleships, he said it was for the Lord Mayor's procession and quickly hung up. By 2326, the task managers were engaged in border disputes, having decided the so-called Khan was not the real problem. Only the signal mattered. 17. The numbers, Mason! What do they mean? The galactic community passed a resolution in 2327 for a galactic defense force under the command of the aging king of the task managers. The Commonwealth recognized the threat of the prophesized crisis, but was reluctant to grant the task managers such power. Support was ultimately given after negotiating higher contributions to the Federation fleet under the Commonwealth's control along with the assurance to focus exclusively on the future contingency threat and no others. The Cardu spoke with King Montgomery about a new supply of Cardu merchandise to fill the human markets. A new line of clothing inspired by human media, mostly anime, and ancient clothing styles from 15th century Earth came to dominate the market forcing much of the populace to have to get used to wearing voluminous hooper lands and their sweeping floor-length sleeves, hoodies with oversized cat ears, and revealing doublets combined with Japanese-made uniforms. At the end of 2328, Citizen Drekken inspired the nation in an otherwise divisive period, taking it upon himself to prepare and give an eloquent speech, detailing his humble beginnings as a miner which a surprising number of people related to. Drekken professed his commitment to faith in his ever-wise King Montgomery. Long may he reign to thunderous applause. 2330. The Cardu informed the Commonwealth that they had explored an extragalactic system called Ultima Vigilis. The system seemed to have a strong connection to, and contain definitive proof of, the Contingency's existence. The Commonwealth implored the galaxy to abandon its petty disputes of war and focus on the real threat. No, not the Judean People's Front, but the Order of the Drake countered, saying that their Federation agreement allowed them to have free reign to wage wars in the northern parts of the galaxy. The debate lasted months, involving insults to the plants, pleas to solve problems diplomatically, and many demands to declare war on various empires. The Commonwealth rallied every asset it could. In 2331, in a desperate bid to be deemed worthy of the Galactic Council, 
every envoy was assigned to the community. Mercenary fleets were hired. The Commonwealth adopted a stance of military supremacy. Anything and everything was done to artificially increase the galactic perception of the Commonwealth's influence. Days before the selection process was scheduled to conclude, the Commonwealth was reminded that the committee had been expanded and that they would have made it on the council in any case. Having heard about the King's failure to respond to the threat of the Death Lords, several members of Parliament raised 17 fingers to protest the inaction against the Death Lords. The significance of raising 17 fingers was unknown, and how each MP was able to raise 17 fingers was quietly glossed over. Report Amendment 14 in 2333, Ministry operatives operating within this timeline suggested that a cascading temporal anomaly had been observed, although reports are conflicting. Some agents reported that they saw Mr. Smith advising the Prime Minister to begin research on further initiatives for creating megastructures. Others observing the same meeting instead insisted Mr. Smith was abducted by dark clothed figures allowing the Prime Minister to instead order Colossus Project World Cracker Research. A third group of operatives, led by Agent Epsilon, were adamant the Prime Minister had ordered the Defender of the Galaxy Initiative, a comprehensive fleet reorganisation and modernisation programme intended to optimise the Greater British Commonwealth's chances against the coming crisis. Further research on this cascade phenomenon is recommended. Report Continuation The Ilarian Death Lords began preparing war with the Codronites in late 2335. An emergency meeting was called where most parties agreed on war. The lone exception was King Montgomery, who continued in his refusal that the so-called Death Lords were indeed Lords of Death, until learning of their purest philosophy and the true strength of their fleet. The terror was obvious in his countenance, and all parties of the council unanimously agreed on war. They were only divided as to whether to label the Death Lords as a crisis, a view which solidified when Mr. Smith informed them that the Alari had killed trillions of alien migrants within their borders, the few survivors suffering the indignity of wearing skin suits to disguise themselves. Parliament voted in favour, and the War of Death began. 17. Uh, again. What can it possibly mean? Rain in November? At the start of 2335, the total population of the Greater British Commonwealth hit a milestone of a trillion sapiens. Xenophobic Dave just grumbled that they should have closed the borders like he said. The brave expeditionary forces of the Commonwealth seized control of the anomalous Sol system on the other side of the galaxy, and provided it with a proper name in 2336. They however failed to include a typographic error in its name, in direct violation of Commonwealth tradition, thanks to a complete lack of clerks to remind them about Commonwealth traditions. Having an intact Venus evoked strong feelings of nostalgia in the expeditionary force who sent word home that Sol 2 Electric Boogaloo would be the perfect place to resettle, should the need ever arise. A junior member of the expedition silently noted that an intact Venus did not make the radioactive husk of a world that was Earth of this mirror Sol system any more habitable. But being a robot and quite looking forward to a quiet retirement in the future, Corporal Toastmaker kept her concerns private. Lord Edward's fleet, the new Boston Tea Party, got caught by the armada of the Alarian Death Lords while on the way to the Hot Stone system in 2338. The fleet was moving to regroup with the combined fleets of the Cardu, the Task Managers and the Commonwealth when the attack occurred, destroying the entire fleet. It was thought that all souls were lost, until Lord Edward himself apparent lackey of the king, was picked up in an escape pod some weeks later, somehow still alive. He insisted that the damage didn't quite look as bad from out here. No one knew quite what he meant. 
The combined fleets then continued without the ships of Lord Edward, the blunder that caused its destruction turning the battle into a prolonged three-month engagement. It was bloody, it was brutal, the losses unfathomable. And although the fleet survived, the Battle of 2339, the Battle of Boibos, was considered a Pyrrhic victory. After the devastating engagement at Boibos, the beleaguered fleets of the Council of Four pursued escaping ships. They gave chase into the Murga system only to discover that they had been baited into a trap. Two pristine Deathlord fleets awaited them, and the ambush was sprung the moment they entered the system. The shock of falling into an ambush, combined with the loss of the flagship Titan of the Galactic Defense Fleet, was too much for the leader of the task managers, who suffered a deadly stroke. The remaining fleets were destroyed, and only half of those that jumped into the system managed to make it out alive. These two massive blows to the fleets of the Council of Four left the fighting force of the Alliance in tatters. Alliance space was effectively undefended. But all was not lost. The galaxy's economy had been funneled into defending the threat, trillions working overtime for little to no pay, fueled by a sense of duty to their empire and the many billions who died in service along with the Cardu energy drink, Liquid Speed. The ships would be rebuilt, the fleets restored. Only time and possible import restrictions on Liquid Speed would tell if the effort would be quick enough. Revelations in 2340. The discovered Sol 2 electric boogaloo was not, in fact, a duplicate of our own solar system. Records found on the devastated planet indicated that the system was some sort of future parallel version. The inhabitants chose to flee the oncoming threat of something they called entropy, somehow managing to move their entire solar system out of their reality, coincidentally causing a collision with our own. The details of how this was done are sketchy at best, and more often contradictory, much to the frustration of scientists across the Commonwealth. One point, however, was consistent. And it became clear that the system's arrival in our reality was the cause of the devastation that destroyed all life on the planet Earth. Recovered from damaged scraps, horrifying video footage deemed too violent to reveal to the general public showed the inhabitants of the planet being torn apart as the sky above the world shattered in its final moments. Analysis of the footage indicated that upon arrival, the planet may have phased into an already existing celestial body, triggering the apocalypse. The year 2340 also saw another glorious retreat, with the Prime Minister invoking the Dunkirk spirit, even if the opposition wanted to watch the Dark Knight again. The Codronite and Order of the Drake fleets finally arrived for the Battle of Boibos in late 2341, some two years after the battle had concluded. They claimed that no one turned up on time these days and simply sauntered into the system to take advantage of the weakened enemy fleet, fighting them back to the edge of the Death Lord space. This gave time for the task manager and human fleets to recover. The Codronites, greedy criminals that they are, couldn't help but steal economically prosperous planets and megastructures left undefended within Deathlord space, while their fleets were distracted and regrouping. But when the Deathlord fleets recovered from the Second Battle of Boibos, the Codronite forces were forced back and inevitably defeated, including an embarrassing defeat in the Andak system, where they lost a majority of their fighting forces to just one Deathlord Armada. Only the Codronite's brutally resurrected undead dragon saved them from utter destruction. Sorry, I, I think I've had too much liquid speed. On the conclusion of an auspicious day for all accountants and clerks, the King proclaimed to Parliament, I am shocked and appalled that any of you would consider a clerk a person. Being April Fool's Day 2356, it was not entirely clear whether the King was merely jesting. Nevertheless, the following morning saw approval ratings for the King plummet. 
The outrage caused by the statement backfired and legislation to de-restrict the occupation passed in a majority 63% vote. So enraged was the king that he had to be physically dragged from parliament, screaming that this would spell doom for the commonwealth. The legislation subsequently got stuck in the pipelines of bureaucracy when the king lodged a successful appeal that this legislation amounted to a constitutional change and needed a two-thirds majority in order to pass. 2360 saw the end of the Death Lords, the last holdouts of the genocidal Alarian government on their worlds were squashed. A little over two decades since the grand engagement of Boibos, this officially brought an end to their empire. It had been a great struggle for the galaxy, but a struggle that strengthened and unified the galaxy more than ever before. 17 for the last time. Ominous, but at least it will soon be able to drink in the pub. In the following years, stars began to disappear in the galactic north. Investigations suggested the cause was a massive increase in the rate of entropy within the area. Any ship sent to investigate the area was subsequently lost without a trace. More concerning, it was discovered the area of accelerated entropy was expanding, with projections predicting the galaxy would be entirely consumed within two centuries. Morningstar, now a celebrity within the Commonwealth, even having starred in his own film, explained that the Codronite's etherophasic engine would allow him to create a protected area within the Shroud, where life from the galaxy could seek sanctuary. The Seraph, now revealed, proclaimed that the accelerated entropy region was God's final gift to creation and that accepting it was not only the correct, but only option. If circumstances weren't dire enough, HHH arrived. They offered to save the galaxy, the whole of reality in fact, if only the Commonwealth would care to sign on the dotted line. No, don't worry, you don't need to read the contract first. Parliament being people, rejected all possible options available and instead decided to try and steal whatever device HHH would use to save their galaxy. Plans were made, distractions planted, the board was set and the pieces were moving. Soon it would be time to see where the chips have fallen. This concludes our analysis of the era of galactic unification. Please refer to the next chapter of this report for further details on the Commonwealth timeline.